And that's actually body uh, absorbing and observing when you're on um, a site or a location that you might be plein air painting. To take that time helps me when I'm in the studio to know when I'm finished because that feeling hits me again. And I say, oh my God, I'm feeling, you know, I feel it now. I feel what I felt, you know, that's what I want to express. And so, you know, to soak that up and, and observe and to have a feeling about what I'm observing helps me know when I've achieved it in the studio. Um, you know, I'll, I'll know. It's like I get that feeling like, oh my God, that's, that's it. Yeah. Welcome to the Bold Brush Show, where we believe that fortune favors a bold brush. My name is Laura Arango Bayer, and I'm your host. For those of you who are new to the podcast, we are a podcast that covers art marketing techniques and all sorts of business tips specifically to help artists learn to better sell their work. We interview artists at all stages of their careers, as well as others who are in careers tied to the art world in order to hear their advice and insights. On today's episode, we sat down with Karen Blackwood, an artist who specializes in seascapes and whose work evokes joy and happiness thanks to her love of the crashing of the waves on the New England coast. Karen tells us about her trajectory from studying the arts, then going into advertising, and going back into pursuing a career in fine art. She also tells us about her transition from portraiture and figurative work to landscapes and seascapes, where she found a deep connection to the power and energy of the ocean. Karen emphasizes the importance of observation, sketching, and recreating the feeling of a scene in her paintings to achieve a sense of completion. She also recounts how she found social media to be a powerful tool in launching her career, connecting with galleries and collectors, while also reminding us not to expect overnight success. She also tells us about how she maintains her relationships with her collectors through consistent communication, inviting them to her studio, and also keeping in touch via her newsletter. Finally, Karen tells us about her upcoming planner workshop in Cape Cod in 2025 and invites us to her salon. Welcome, Karen, to the Bold Brush Show. How are you today? Good, Laura. Thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm honored. Well, I'm happy to have you because your work is absolutely gorgeous, as I was telling you uh, before we started. Um, I was very drawn to your work uh, because it is just, it, it just seems so full of joy and happiness um, that I was like, I have to have her on. She has such a sweet vibe. Um, I really want to talk to her. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And you know, that actually is so nice that my work emits that because I do feel like when um, we moved to the East Coast and I saw waves crashing, I swear I was like a kid jumping off rocks jumping from another one and I actually had this lady you know look at me because I was so excited by the waves and she said is this your first time seeing the ocean oh <laughs> no I just yeah I get like like somebody gets excited by the fourth of July I get excited by waves crashing yeah. they just are awesome you know they make oh you feel God. Um, like you've just seen, you know, a 4th of July firework show. It's just amazing. Yes, it is. And it definitely shows in the work. And I love that. Um, and before we talk more about your work, do you mind telling us a bit about who you are and what you do? I am an artist on the North Shore of Boston. Um, I started out in a fine arts program at a local university, the University of New Hampshire, had um, incredible teachers. I really felt lucky. I had uh, a solid academic training um, and went into advertising somehow because I didn't know how to be an artist um, and didn't know artists growing up. And it's just, I think the universe kind of pulls you back. Um, and when we moved from New York where I was an art director in advertising to LA or Burbank, California, um, I slowly found my way back into my fine arts. Um, you know, it's just, I think people get pulled at different times and I took a detour that honestly I see in my work. So whatever I've, you know, learned along the way that wasn't fine art somehow is in my work, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, is there anything specific that you would say from advertising that like actually really shows in the work or? I 
think uh, from my advertising days, there's um, awareness of design. Um, mm-hmm. I was an art director and we did print ads and commercials, but you were always thinking of um, the design aspect and grabbing somebody's attention. So I think from that, I learned that as well as business and how to treat um, the art as my job. You know, it's like a business and how to approach it because I think coming from a university fine art program, um, it's a little more esoteric and you, you aren't really, you know, you're, you're, in the academics of it. Um, And the only thing I knew was uh, to be a fine artist and to teach, you know, that you basically went on for your master's and then you would, you know, enter a college program, be a teacher, do your art. And I didn't see that. And I ended up veering off and went into advertising for eight years. Um, Mm -hmm. But it was somebody leaving our agency to go back to her fine art that, um, you know, kind of clicked an idea bubble in my head, like, oh my God, <laughs> she's leaving, she's getting out. And I realized I didn't have to do this and I could go back to my fine art um, and had to figure that out, had to figure out how do I make a living as an artist. And uh, the advertising, I think, helped. It was treating it like a business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think the other good thing about the the advertising experience that you got was it's it's very more much more concrete in the way that things are handled uh, compared to, you know, the like the whole reason we even have the show is precisely because you know being in the fine arts and trying to sell your work is, you know, it can be a bit of a mystery for a lot of people. Like, how did they do it? How did they do it? And which is why you know we interview people like you who have had that experience. And mm-hmm. everyone's experience is totally different. Um, so it's good that you had that background to help you, I guess, move along. Um, how was that like for you, though? When when you started again after your advertising, what was it like for you to, okay, I'm, I like say like, okay, I got to like start doing this and start doing that. What was it like for you? Because I did see that you started out in portraiture and figurative work, and then you meandered over to landscape and seascape. Right. It's almost like the universe again. I actually started in portraiture and figurative because I had been academically trained and that's what I knew. Um, And I did watercolors in the beginning because I did not have a studio space. We were in an apartment. Um, You know, I didn't have a place to set up oils. So I got into watercolor and, um, and was doing portraits my husband was on a soap so I was doing like Deidre Hall's family's portraits and I you know just did a lot of that and then a friend asked me if I would paint a landscape in their home like sunrise to sunset they had a um, a California bungalow and uh, and I was free to paint whatever I wanted so it was literally a painting on walls so I had a nice big canvas and I uh, I got hooked and I realized how much I loved landscape. And in college, we really didn't do a lot of landscape painting. So I did not even know that's what I um, was drawn to. And uh, that got me into acrylic painting because I did the murals in acrylic. And I got asked to do another big estate, you know, home mural. It was palm trees. And that was the only guidance. So it was basically a landscape again. Um, and after doing the murals, I joined the California Art Club, started to plein air paint, um, and just got hooked and found that that was something I was drawn to. That was my muse, where the figurative work, I was doing it because that's what I knew, and I loved painting, and I could breathe again. I felt like I was back where I could actually, you know, gasp air again. And um, and it wasn't until the landscapes where I was obsessed, like, you know, where you have to balance your life and say, OK, I got to make time for my husband and my, you know, my child. So I think with the landscapes, um, you know, that was an obsession. That was more like, you know, there aren't enough hours in the day to to paint what you want to paint. So that was. That was the trajectory of that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then <clears throat> of course you went from landscapes into seascapes. Yes. Um, yeah, when that did is- that happen? Well, you know, part of that was when I was in California. Um, I had a studio at that point, so I could do, um, I was still doing acrylic painting back in California, though. And um, I would travel to the East Coast and go to Cape Cod. And so I would work on those paintings back in my California studio. (laughs) And they would all sell. It was so funny. And um, I didn't get to the ocean much from Burbank, California, because what should have been a half an hour drive from Burbank to the nearest beach, you know, typically would be a three hour drive because of traffic. So I didn't get there as much as one would think living in California. And it wasn't until we moved uh, to our current home on the North shore of Boston. Um, I was thinking when I returned to New England, I thought, oh, you know, the mountains, the, you call it farms. That's really what I pictured I was going to paint. And then we moved to Newburyport, Mass., which is a 13-minute drive from the beach. And um, we went over, and it was instant where I just said, oh, wow, this is this is what I'm going to paint. And I didn't know what I wanted to say, though. And in my training, um, intent is very important. And you're not just painting a pretty picture. You know, you, what do you want to say? Why are you going to say it? So for me, I walked the beach like months before it started to really kind of um, come to, you know, a clear vision of what it is that I'm drawn to. Why am I so excited by it? And what, mm-hmm. what do I want to say about it? And, um, and for me, it was really the power of it, the energy. Um, you know, I don't see a wave as a, a light spray. You know, I see it as heavy weight and this big crescendo of crashing water and the, you know, it's that explosion and the joy of it. And even in the, um, we get a lot of nor'easter like storms. And even in that, there's this beautiful poetry that, you know, just can be expressed um, just through that energy and that power. So yeah, I became hooked on the sea and. Um, still haven't tired of it you know it's just it's amazing I think it'll be forever I don't know yeah I mean I love that because it you know the thing that you do right should really be something that you enjoy so much that you don't think it's work right it should be something that almost gives you more energy than takes it away yeah Yeah. very good yeah that's true it does like um I my daughter, it's so funny, my husband's an actor, writer, my daughter, I mean, actor, singer, and my daughter is a writer. And um, we were the parents that, you know, like, in my childhood, I didn't even know I could be an artist. It just wasn't, you know, a thing. And in my daughter's, it's almost like the pressure to be an artist, because for us, that is such joy to be able to do what you love, you know, and it's like, you, yeah, you don't work a day. It's I. You know, a little dirty secret is like, I would do this for free. <laughs> you know, you just you just want to paint all the time. And when you find something that you really want to understand and master, um, you know, you're just never, ever going to know enough about it. You're just never going to, you know, express everything that you want to say. Beautiful. I love that. Oh. It, it's it's really cute too because it's like um you can sense when someone really loves what they do what they do and you're definitely one of those people um and especially you know I really love how you started you know realizing that why while you were exploring you know the the seascape um and I think the other thing that I really like about how you described you know why it drew you towards it is you know historically that area of you know the New England area it has a lot of history with the ocean. And I think also capturing it, it it's very timeless because the people who were there before and the people who were there before them, they've all seen it as well. They've probably all been in awe at it as well, both in good awe and in fear because of those storms. I mean, yeah, any yeah. storm would have been terrifying, but capturing it the way that you do is very, 
it's like you said, it's very poetic. It is. And it's kind of like you're odd and you um, respect it. You know, it's like the power yes. of it. It's not. Yeah. yeah. It's I actually um, think I first experienced it in college. I used to body surf and I got caught up in, um, you know, a massive wave and I ended up on the top of it. So instead of riding through it, I got spun like a, you know, washing machine and then spit out. And I was like Marge Simpson crawling out of the beach with sand piled in my hair. And I'm just lucky because that was immense power. And I think that's possibly why I see the ocean as so much weight of water um, because it's powerful. And that's just one body surfing wave. So you can imagine on the nor'easters, like, um, you know, those are just awe inspiring. They're, yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm I'm both in fear and uh in joy, you know, when those waves hit. Those yes. are like Yeah. They're yeah, just... like like the one that's right behind you. Uh oh yeah. yeah. That was an incredible day. That was like um after the hurricanes, I believe Hurricane Sandy possibly from mm. Florida, we got um the nor'easter after that. And oh wow, they were just like I I think that one was like going into somebody's backyard. <laughs> like I had to get to that wave. Um, mm-hmm. And it was just a beautiful wall of waves crashing. Um, <sighs> yeah, it was amazing. So, oh. yeah, we, I can't wait till the fall. That's when we start to get some of those. Um, yeah, you're making me want to go up there so I can see <laughs> them. <laughs> Because I've, I've actually never been to to Massachusetts, so it would be really nice to uh, oh, to experience yeah. it. This way. Yeah, the ocean is um, Maine along the Maine coast. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's it's more craggy, so it's got you know more um, more oomph to it than just. Sometimes I think I enjoy just the roll of the wave and the ebb and tide, but I for me it mm-hmm. really is that powerful moment of crashing on the rocks you know that really sets me off (laughs) but you know I appreciate both I appreciate Florida's waves as well those are you know gorgeous and uh stunning and they have beautiful skies um which we all but yeah I always think sometimes like California if I were living there painting the ocean I think Sometimes their cliffs are so tremendous and the waves smaller in comparison. Mm -hmm. So the paintings would be more about possibly the sky and, and the cliffs with the water hitting that where I think here it's the water that's much more uh, Mm -hmm. present Mm -hmm. and the rocks are there, but that battle's a little more even. Um, And on the West coast, I think, they have some massive cliffs and just, you know, vantage points that are much higher than we yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, it's funny you use the word battle because that's literally what came to mind. It's like the battle between the land and the sea. Yeah. Um, I love yeah, that. that dichotomy of those two. It's kind of, um, you know, the rock is solid and hard, but that water, <laughs> you know, yeah. it and, and covers it. It's like. So yeah, there is that kind of, it's fun to play with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I really love that. Uh, I was also curious to know, um, since you've had a, a very interesting career, you know, going from fine art, then, you know, advertising and then back to fine art, what do you find has been the, the greatest lesson that you've learned from your artistic career? Uh, you know, I think my work started to become much more consistent uh one was using something called the armature of the rectangle I think before that um the one thing that would make me you know throw away a painting or you know just give up on it was if the structure was there so uh you know no matter how beautiful a paint stroke you were going to do or you know the colors you would add it's like if that structure wasn't there, I wasn't going to like the painting. So mm-hmm. when I had um, come across the armature of the rectangle, it just kind of 
was one of those things I thought, huh, you know, I might try that in landscape because I had seen it, you know, applied to Da Vinci or Renaissance painting, but I hadn't thought about it for um, landscape. And I tried it and it became this organic structure to hold all the elements. And, um, and I don't even notice it. I have it on my sketches now. So if I do a thumbnail sketch, I put the armature on, it's on all my canvas. It's just there and it's organic. And it, I, since I started using that, I've yet to have a painting that doesn't hold up for me. So it, you know, it was a strong tool and I don't use it the way, like I actually told some guy who is, you know, a mathematician and he started going off on numbers and it's like, you know, makes my stomach turn because I'm much more, um, organic and intuitive a painter and I feel my way through things mm -hmm. um so I use it in a very simplistic way it just sits underneath um I would say that and just realizing that the more work I put in the more work I have to do I have more ideas so work begets work it's like if I you know take the time to really read up on things and and put that extra time doing a sketch before the painting or even a color sketch, um, the work's stronger and it just fuels the work. And I noticed that when I do a pencil sketch, more so than a color sketch, um, I find things in the piece that I don't think I would find if I just jumped in. Um, I see patterns, I see shapes that <clears throat> you know, like rather than focusing on detail, I focus on shapes and ways to move in the painting. And I think by sketching, it slows me down. It allows me to um, basically paint it first in my head with values only. So you really start to get to know the subject. So by the time you paint it, I, I kind of rely on that sketch as much as a reference or my memory. It, the sketch kind of has all the work in it so um it becomes my guide and things get changed for instance in this painting mm -hmm. um when i did the sketch on location the rocks actually you know went across the foreground and it didn't serve the painting so through the sketch i was able to open a pathway which then led to the star which was that massive wave crashing um, so taking time to do the sketch allows me to, you know, create the painting, you know, because you're kind of trying to capture a scene, but ultimately you're trying to create a painting that expresses that scene. Yeah. Um, Apple Brush, we inspire artists to inspire the world because creating art creates magic. And the world is currently in desperate need of magic. Bold Brush provides artists with free art marketing, creativity, and business ideas and information. This show is an example. We also offer written resources, articles, and a free monthly art contest open to all visual artists. We believe that fortune favors the bold brush. And if you believe that too, sign up completely free at boldbrushshow.com. That's B-O-L-D-B-R-U-S-H show.com. The Bold Brush Show is sponsored by Basso. Now more than ever, it's crucial to have a website when you're an artist, especially if you want to be a professional in your career. Thankfully, with our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast, you can make that come true and also get over 50% off your first year on your artist website. Yes, that's basically the price of 12 lattes in one year, which I think is a really great deal considering that you get sleek and beautiful website templates that are also mobile friendly, e-commerce, print on demand in certain countries, as well as access to our marketing center that has our brand new art marketing calendar. And the art marketing calendar is something that you won't get with our competitor. The art marketing calendar gives you day-by-day, step-by-step guides on what you should be doing today, right now, in order to get your artwork out there and seen by the right eyes so that you can make more sales this year. So if you want to change your life and actually meet your sales goal this year, then start now by going to our special link, faso.com forward slash podcast. That's F-A-S-O dot com forward slash podcast. Wow. I like that because, you know, it goes to show that, you know, kind of like how you said, the more you work and the more you study, the more studying you realize you have to do. Yes. Um, yeah. And I, I love that because, you know, it it almost feels like an endless game instead of 
especially when you enjoy it instead of it being like this endless like i don't know like a kind of like the rat and little hamster wheel or something um it yeah. feels a little bit more like a game instead of something arduous and, and heavy it's it's fun yeah. Yeah, yeah it really is and it's kind of i think maybe that is something that artists are very lucky to have is that mm -hmm. um you know, you you want to understand things and you want to see things. And I feel like when I went back to my art leaving advertising days, um, I would step outside and see color. You know, and I think people go about their lives if they're if they're not as lucky as an artist gets to slow down and and uh, really see deeply. I think people just go about and they don't see the color. They don't see the the light and where that hits. And I think that um, it's our inquisitive nature and our desire to see and to keep knowing, you know, to see deeper and to know more. And, you know, I think that uh, that's what makes it so fun. It's like, you know, yeah, how lucky are we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's eye candy for us. Um, yeah, just yeah. life. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I guess because also, you know, deep down, the act of, of painting, the act of drawing, really is the act of seeing clearly. Yeah. You know, yeah. seeing what you're what you're trying to you know draw or imitate. Um, and since we use that so much for us, you know, seeing a rose or seeing a a tree is like, oh, how would you do that? How would I how would I express that shape with a with a paintbrush or with a pencil? Whereas you know, for someone else, they could still see it as a beautiful tree, but we would be thinking, how can I? Yeah. How can I get this so that yes. I can? How can I show it to everyone else? Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Usually when I'm out on, uh, like if I'm in a on the beach on a nor'easter, I'm not going to set up my easel and paint. And I'll think like I'll be taking my photos and I'll think, ah, oh, the camera's never going to capture this. So mm -hmm. it's it really <laughs> is like you having to really you know look and see because you've got to take that back. To your studio and express it so you have to you know bank that in your memory so that you can you know get that down um and i'll usually put notes on my reference when i do a crappy printout i kind of <laughs> prefer the crappy printout because i'll rely on you know on my memory as opposed mm -hmm. to trying to copy a image and i think you know like i'll leave notes saying oh it's much more of a glow or there were, you know, it was much more cool. And, you know, so when I get home, I'm immediately making notes of that because otherwise you just, yeah, the camera never captures that for me anyway. Yeah. Yeah. That's the unique part of, you know, human vision. Uh, there's, we all see things in a particular way and the things that we see capture us for a certain reason. So okay. yeah, that's a really great way of doing your studio practice. Um, Cause I would have thought that you know, most of your paintings were either done on site or have that on site sketch. Um, so it's good that you're able to properly translate the picture because it today it today I find that it's so hard for for artists to completely disengage <clears throat> when they're using a picture, like disengage yeah. from the, the the camera eye instead of like yeah. the human yeah. eye. Yeah, make it more about what you remember, and I think. Um, especially with the ocean, I would say observation is about as important as when I go plein air paint. Part of it is the plein air painting helps me know true color, uh, movement, but it really is spending time just observing and watching and seeing what's happening and, you know, really soaking it up so that when I paint, I can be as fresh as when I'm painting in plein air at the ocean. Mm -hmm. So that um, what I enjoy about the studio is that I am also uh, in my place of Zen. So I both love to plein air paint because I find that's a fast way to get a painting and I can observe and all my information is there and I, you know, it's, it's easier. Studio can be more angst, but it's also my Zen and it's a more internal place so that those internal questions can come into the work as opposed to my reacting to the scene I can uh, you know kind of be a little more um, contemplative I guess in the studio which yeah. I'm 
kind of like that that time. Oh, I love that. Yeah. And and I'd like that, you know, the, the fact that you mentioned um, observing, just observing, not not doing anything, but observing. I think, you know, that also touches on the very, very underrated uh, thing that people use and should use more, which is memory. Um, yes. I think, yeah, I think it's so underrated um, because memory means if you can remember something properly, it means that you've observed it and you've learned it and you can now apply it, right? It's one thing to like, it's almost like when you, um, gosh, when you're learning a language, literally, like you have to know the words and you have to memorize them and use them properly. It's very much the same with painting. You have to memorize the visual language so that then you can apply it. Um, and that's part of that observation. I think it's very underrated. And that's actually by... Uh absorbing and observing when you're on um, a site or a location that you might be plein air painting to take that time helps me when I'm in the studio to know when I'm finished because that feeling hits me again and I say oh my god I'm feeling you know I feel it now I feel what I felt you know <laughs> that's what I want to express and so you know to soak that up and and observe and to have a feeling about what I'm observing helps me know when I've achieved it in the studio um, you know I'll I'll know it's like I get that feeling like oh my god that's that's it yeah, yeah. And so that's kind of my stopping point and sometimes I catch myself putting a piece out and, you know, I'm like, eh, it's not really done. And that's being lazy because then when I take it back and say, yeah, no, I don't think it was done. Um, and if I push myself to go beyond just the graphically interesting, you know, painting, there's that emotional layer that you'll feel if you push beyond, you know. That's brilliant. Yeah, that's brilliant. Because oftentimes I think one of the things a lot of people struggle with is how do I know I'm done? Like, when am yeah. I finished? And yeah, recreating that feeling because the eye, you know, the, the painting reaches a point where like you look at it and you think, oh, this is like the real thing, right? This is like looking at the real thing. And if it does have that feeling, oh, yeah, yeah, that definitely hits us, the nail on the head with that. Yeah, That's great. Yeah. Yeah. More fun for us too. It's like, because then you get excited. You're like, oh my God. Yeah, that's it. So, yeah. yeah to paint and then retreat what we were so moved by in the first place you know exactly oh that's genius yeah and um I really I want to go back to uh that transition where you went from your day job right as a in advertising yeah. to painting H how was that jump like for you what was that transition like it was a long and you know I didn't have any idea how to do it I just knew <laughs> I wanted to so when I left New York and we moved to Burbank, I freelanced in advertising for a couple more years um, and decided I was going to go back to my fine arts. I had taken a class at a place called Barnesdale Art Center, and it was, um, you know, bohemian, you know, artsy, and it was like, Oh my gosh. And I took a class, a watercolor class, and it was literally like I could breathe again. And I thought, you know, oh my God, how did I leave it for so long? Mm -hmm. And um, so I knew I wanted to get back to it. And um, I waited on tables. I left advertising, waited on tables, and actually had a group from my <laughs> in New York come. And I thought, like, oh my God, they're going to see me. I'm oh. that table. <laughs> and then I thought, you know what? I'm proud. I'm, you know, doing what I love. So I went up to the table and said, yeah, you know, I left it. And, you know, I'm waiting tables trying to figure it out. And, um, and they were, of course, most of them are all artists. They're all creatives. So they were all like, you know, in awe that <laughs> somebody takes the path away from the safe, you know, guaranteed income. Um, so it was a slow path, started with my figures because I knew that, then got asked to do the murals and then um, moved towards landscape. Still wasn't, you know, I was teaching in my studio um, and teaching at local art centers um, 
to subsidize my income. And it wasn't until I moved, we moved to Michigan and I got my first gallery. So in California, I didn't need the gallery um, because I was busy doing portraits, teaching, and seemed to sell locally. And then when I moved to Michigan, I was a little more isolated out there. It's not quite, you know, I didn't have an art community um, and I got a gallery in Connecticut. So that got me out to the East Coast and I could paint. Um, and then it wasn't until I became, you know, socially, social media aware that my career started to take off. I would say that's the biggest thing that moved it from, uh, you know, making, painting, selling in the galleries. But um, I would say I, I all the magazines I've been in somehow came from somebody seeing me, my work on social media um, and came to me via social media. I've sold work on social media. Uh, galleries approached me from social media. So I would say that, uh, you know, I always think like if I had had that tool when I had left college, mm -hmm. it could have been a whole nother, you know, thing because that was the missing link for me was how to do it. And mm -hmm. I think artists today have, you know, like a zillion artists that they can reach out to or they can follow, they can see what they're doing, they can see it's possible you know, that we can make a living, that we, you know, can do quite well. And I think, um, yeah, I would say social media kind of changed the game for me because it was putting the work out there, um, you know, where I think until you're used to doing that, I was one of those, uh, I would do my paintings and then they'd end up in the closet, you know, and I, my husband's friend from his acting class came over one day and she's like, oh, I'd love to see your work. And I, so I was like, oh, okay. So I went to the closet and <laughs> brought it out. And she's like, what is it doing in the closet? <laughs> like, put your work out. And it was such a hard thing to put my work out. You know, that was such an emotional, uh, you know, expo vulnerability. You know, like I was yeah. so um, vulnerable because you're, you're so in your work. And I think social media helps you get over that a lot quicker put your work out, you know, and it's, um, it's a positive. I mean, I have a lot of problems with social media in other ways and, you know, we love and hate it, but as artists, it's a great tool. You know, we're lucky we have a community that, you know, you have a zillion artists you can get to know and, you know, mm -hmm. see how many incredibly talented people there are out there. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I, I love what you mentioned, too, about community, because um, you would, you know, if if social media wasn't there, it would be a lot more lonely for artists. It would be, I think, yeah. a lot harder, kind of like how it was, you know, obviously pre-social media where galleries were the only way to go. Um, but today, for sure, it, it's become really great because you can talk to you know other artists who will support you and you support them. Yeah. Um, and they're all over the world, which is the other really cool yeah. thing because they have different experiences and uh, yeah, the connections and of course the sales are really great. Right. Yeah, it is. And artists are very supportive. I think I remember that in um, in my college days, you know, that artists love other artists. You know, we just mm -hmm. we appreciate each other's work. There's um, there's kind of like a shared love. And I think, you know, you get that support from social media. It's a positive, yes. you know, that you can put your work out and there's this wonderful supportive community of artists who appreciate each other's work. Um, yeah. And that's cool. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. And I did want to know too, um, because of course you have the experience, what advice would you give to an artist who's looking to live from their work? I think um, nowadays it's very funny because when I went to college for art, um, I had a great art program and luckily had 
some incredible uh, professors who, you know, were pretty well known in their own right. Um, so I don't regret that at all for my time. But I would say for artists now, they don't need the four year um, traditional university experience that if anything, I would go for the atelier schools or like the New York Academy or, you know, a two year program where you are meshed with other artists. And then you have Facebook as a guide for how to, you know, it's like, um, or Instagram or, you know, whatever social media, it's like you, you have that um, network of Mm -hmm. help if you need it or people to reach out to. And I would say to use that um, and then just put the work in, you know, if you take the work seriously, put uh, your little job cap on and treat it like this is your job. And, you know, you put the time in like you would to any job um, and you'll see, you know, massive results just from putting that time in. Yeah. Yeah, it's that consistency in the end that helps. I mean, if you if you hadn't had that breadth of work, right? If you hadn't had all of those paintings, um, maybe social media wouldn't have like been such yeah. a big, big thing. But you were ready. You already had all of the stuff that you needed. And and I agree yeah. that's very important. Um yeah. yeah, putting it out too soon. And that's one thing that um I think you see on social media is that for the pitfalls of somebody who doesn't real like I've had um students sometimes who think they take a workshop you know they're going to make their living you know like after taking a workshop maybe they've taken five (laughs) you know and I think like they see artists out there and they don't know that you have put in a lot of years of study and work and that it just it doesn't happen you know like uh from one class or one you know, that it's, it's a, you can't compare yourself to other artists Just stay on your path, you know, mm-hmm. do your thing and keep growing and keep working. And um, sometimes the results are, you know, people expect it too quickly and they give up, you know, when it's a long road. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like enjoying the, the journey um, and don't worry about the results. Just love the journey. And that would oh. be my advice. I love that. That is very true. It is, it is the journey. The journey is the destination. That's the, yeah. one of the <laughs> yeah. Um, that's one of the the sayings that I've heard. And I, I feel like it's very, very true. Um, and especially, you know, just seeing you, you're a great example of that where you just you're in it, you love it, and you can feel it in the work, which is uh, amazing. Okay. Amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Actually, we're le- we're so lucky. I feel um, it's not about the income for me, and it never was, you know. And I'm thankful to make an income, but it's uh, it is like just feeling so lucky that you have this talent and that you can do this. It's like um, you know, it's a nice way to make a living. Yes, and it to have really a life, is. a nice way to have a life. <laughs> Yeah, and it's a much more organic life, I feel, because you can be more present um, and actually sleep all night and not wake up early. And <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I used to stress when I was in advertising. Yeah, there were times where I was so stressed out. Um, and and yet, you know, for some people, that is their art. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, I think all of us have a different uh, way of expressing ourselves in life and for some that was it for me it wasn't so it wasn't uh natural it wasn't you know it's like this was where I could breathe again you know yeah yeah I feel the same way I feel like the the rhythm is much more like you said organic it's much more um in tune with you know I don't your natural way of being and and that's the really beautiful thing about this career I think (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And some of us just take a little longer to get to that, you know, and I think nowadays, um, I hope anyway, that artists have so much information out there that they can follow their path, you know, early on. Yes, 
Definitely. Which actually brings me to a question that I want to ask you, which is what have you found has been the best way that you have marketed your work? Has it been only social media, galleries, maybe painting societies? Like what's been the best avenue? Uh, I think the best avenue is definitely social media, you know, if I'm honest, and my galleries. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I have one local that I've gotten a lot of students who've seen my work there, um, you know, buyers from the gallery. I would say social media, though, got me the gallery, gets mm -hmm. me, you know what I mean? So that, I think, has been my biggest thing. And and I joined uh, the American Society of Marine Artists, and oh. I think the museum tours gets my work seen um, in different parts of the country, and, you know, that's a cool thing. Um, but, yeah, I would say social media is, is what a tool, you know, for an artist. I think it's a uh, – it's almost – you almost say, ah, do we really need galleries? Because we can do it on social media. But I do get a lot from my galleries um, that I couldn't get on social media because they're the ones that work for you. There are, you know, a handful of galleries that are just gold, you know, and you, you know the difference between a gallery that's working for you and a gallery, you know, that just you know, hangs your work, but they're not putting that extra work in for you. And I think so they still earn their, you know, their percentage. It's like, I think in the old days, galleries used to be the ones that got you the magazine articles, got you, you know, known and got your name out there. I think social media does that now. Um, but a good gallery is still a sales yeah. um, source and builds, um, they are wonderful at building collectors. And I love, there's one gallery I can visit more often. And um, they are so good at engaging young collectors, which I love seeing that because just gives me chills. The thought that, you know, young people are showing an interest in collecting original work. Um, because mm -hmm. for a while, I worried that, oh my God, the poster thing that we see sometimes in decorating or, you know, that we're going to lose that love of original work. Um, but no, I'm seeing a lot of young collectors, you know, really show an interest and understand the difference between what a poster would do in your place versus a piece of original work, the kind of life that's in that work. Um, there's an energy. Well, hopefully, yeah, artists are trying to put that energy into the work. So I think it's nice that young collectors are, um, you know, they're, I think the future is good for artists. <laughs> I think we're good. Oh, I love that. I love that. That's such a positive message because so many people, especially in the realism realm, are so afraid of that, that, you know, there won't be enough collectors or that no one has an interest because, of course, the predominant market is contemporary. Um, and, you know, I, I like hearing that there there's hope uh, that there are people out there who are, you know, in their in their youth who are interested and can also yeah. afford it because that's the other side, you know, can can they afford it? Um, so that's good. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I think, um, you know, a lot of young people earn more money than they used to. So they do have income and it's realizing the value of art in their life that mm -hmm. that's worth, you know, some of that income that they earn. Uh, I think, you know, it's like people who um, will spend a fortune on, you know, I don't know, the latest tech thing or yeah. So whatever it's nice to know that art is still um a part of the scene and i think for realism you know it'll always be here i think there's always going to be a market and i think we owe a lot to you know um the realist who didn't give up on it and stayed with it pearlstein and you know was at a time when he could have easily, you know, 
pushed his work abstract. But, you know, I think Wyeth, they all hung in there and stayed true mm -hmm. to realism. And I think abstract and contemporary work will always have a place as well. And unfortunately, a majority, mm -hmm. and I think that's, who knows whether some of that is, you know, uh, just the market and on Wall Street of art or, you know, a place to put money. But um but I think there's room for both. And I think as long as we build both markets, because actually I think a realist has abstraction in their work and you know <laughs> good abstraction usually comes from people who have been trained academically and make decisions from a academic perspective and have that structure in their work. Because um, yeah. I know abstraction is hard. It's a hard thing to be able to do well. Mm -hmm. But there's mm -hmm. so much bad abstraction out there that a lot of uneducated buyers can't tell the difference. You know, they don't know. Um, but yeah, good abstract work is a difficult piece to achieve. Um, so mm -hmm. I think there's room for both. I completely agree. Yeah, I don't like uh, when some people think that, you know, only one can exist or one should push out the yeah. other. Yeah, yeah because it's there's room for everyone. Aim space too i love when a collector um you know combines abstract work with realist work i think it's a beautiful to pair different mm -hmm. work um, I, one guy who uh commissioned nine pieces for his home and i was so honored to be in his home because he had like a hopper and he had you know i felt like i was in a museum with his home but it was such an eclectic mix of work so he wasn't strictly collecting one uh genre of art he had you know like everything which hopefully you know there's always going to be room for both you know. yes Learn <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's almost kind of like how um you know abstract you know is of course a derivative of of classical painting um yeah. the same way that like rock is a derivative of classical music you know like it, it has to come from somewhere yeah that's very true and you'll actually hear symphonic uh compositions within rock you know yes. so yeah 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 so, exactly um and speaking of since you mentioned your collector um how have you you know a, how do you approach building and maintaining relationships with your collectors I actually um, have one collector that is one of my best collectors who found me online um, when I lived in Michigan and bought a piece and uh, continues to uh, buy my work out here now. And I've had her to my home and I usually will have a once a year uh, salon show at home where I invite only um my collectors or um future collectors kind of like a, a way to just show them what I'm working on um so they become you know friends and I value them and then through my galleries I would say um you know they maintain a really strong relationship with collectors and anytime I'm working on a new piece they'll make sure that collector gets to see it um and then out on social media um you know people get to stay in touch and the newsletter actually on uh the faso website my newsletter i built a strong following during covid i couldn't paint my large paintings i thought i would kill them and i um and i knew i had to paint so i did a um that I could keep working and I knew I could sustain focus for, you know, a six by eight. So I think I painted about 80 of them, close to 80 and sold them all through my newsletter on Faso. So I would let the buyers know that, you know, next Tuesday, you know, look for my newsletter and, and first come first serve, it gets sold to, you know, whoever tells me I want it. And so I built up, um, you know, I think I added 400 followers from that campaign on that uh, on that newsletter because they were buying the painting. So um, 
So the newsletter is also a big thing. I would say social media and keeping in touch through a consistent newsletter on FASO has been, yeah, fine art studio online for those who don't know. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's, you know, I love that you bring that up because I think that's another thing that's pretty underrated. You know, people, the real people who sign up for your newsletter are people who are actually interested in buying, right? Because like your followers on Instagram, they're sometimes they're just there to support or just there to be looky loos or to be inspired. But then the people who really are interested and want to know more and want to be engaged, they will definitely sign up for, for a newsletter and maintaining that list is also very important. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, those are the people who um, a lot of them are artists themselves and mm -hmm. a lot are um, actual art buyers um, or or people who have a love for the arts. And, you know, you know, your work is speaking to that person because they've taken the time to sign up. And um, yeah, that actually I sometimes forget to be as consistent if I don't have a campaign or something mm -hmm. going, but it is important to uh, maintain that relationship because they signed up and they, you know, they want um, to know what's happening and what's new. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a lot more, uh, I guess it's a lot more intimate in that way because yeah. on, on social media, it's just an image. Maybe you'll put like a little paragraph underneath, but with a newsletter and and if you also keep a blog, which I know that on Faso you can have a blog, you can also write longer form things. And there are people who will read it, they'll comment, and they'll email you. And I think that's yeah, such a wonderful yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, I love getting the emails back. I love when I send the newsletter out and I'll get, you know, responses back, even if it's just to say hi or, you oh. know, got it. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Yeah, because yeah, it reminds me that you're not, you know, that because I feel like, you know, being an artist is kind of very solitary thing yes. so it's good to get those emails back because you remember you're not really alone uh there are people who are almost like flies on the wall in your studio <laughs> yes, yeah exactly that they actually you know want to see and I should do actually um can we do videos on the newsletter I wonder I have never tried oh, I think to. you can I think you can link a video oh. yeah you can link a video in there I'll do a studio yeah a studio tour for them yeah. yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, and speaking of, you know, um, being more open and, and vulnerable with, uh, you know, people who love your work and being present, do you have any upcoming shows or workshops that you'd like to promote? I just taught one, so I don't have a workshop to promote. I just did um, Lime Art Association. And I, since COVID, paired my, I used to do about four where I would, Wow. Go to Carmel, California, do one in Connecticut, do one, you know, um, Cape Cod. Now I do one a year. So um, next year will be Cape Cod in Chatham at the uh, Creative Arts Center, which I love going out there. Um, we always do plein air on Narragansett and the waves have always been, um, my cat, have always been uh, really strong there. So that's a wonderful workshop. But that will be in September of 2025. Okay. Um, and then just the galleries to look for my work in are Todd Bonita Gallery in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Todd Bonita Gallery in Agunquit, Maine, um, Camden Falls Gallery in Camden Falls, Maine, and uh, Valerie's Gallery in uh, Newburyport, Mass. So you can find my work there and um, I do need to work on a show, but I don't have one lined up anytime soon. And if you do want to come to my home salon, if you are um, interested in being a collector, you can always go to my website on Faso and just look up my name and Karen Blackwood Fine Art dot com. Great. Awesome. And then uh, I think you also have social media, right? You have Instagram. <laughs> And, and yes, I have Instagram and Facebook, and I always post whatever I'm doing new on there. Um, so usually I'll even post, um, I try to post a beginning stage block in and then post a mid stage and then a final stage of the painting so people can kind of um, follow along and 
see how it began and how it ended. Yeah, I love that. Well, and of course, all of your links are going to be included in the show notes for anyone who wants to immediately check those out, which I highly recommend because you will feel very happy <laughs> seeing all of these paintings because they are so, so expressive and definitely emit joy. Uh, thanks, Laura. It was You're so welcome. nice talking to you. Yeah, you too. And thank you for coming onto the show and uh, being a spark of joy. <laughs> uh, thanks a lot. Have a great day. You too. Thank you.